Thy word is the lamb unto my feet and the light unto my path. Thy word is the lamb unto my feet and the light unto my path. When I feel afraid, Think I lost my way, but still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please hold me to your side. Thy word is the lamb unto my feet and a light. Unto my path. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. A good clap offering. And you may be seated. As we look on into the book of Acts, there was a point that I felt that I need to stress on, on the development of ministry. Before we go on, after Acts 6, we have gone Acts 2 and Acts 6. By Acts 6, they obviously have apostles, pastors, and teachers. The prophets and the evangelists were still in the embryo state developing. And that is, uh, there is a natural progression in life. I put it as N. And a spiritual progression and a ministry progression. We have that third line added to us when God called. The people in this world have this end line, the natural line. We have the spiritual line. And uh, well, once in a while we write things backwards. So we have the natural, natural line, <laughs> and then we have the spiritual line, the spiritual line, uh, you should read it with the other side of your brain, uh, and then we have the ministry line. The ministry line. And uh, these uh, three lines are always there in our life as long as you're spiritual in body. The natural people have this line. Can, can you read that? Is that all right for you? Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, and then we have the spiritual line and the ministry line. If you're not called to the ministry, you don't have the ministry line to develop in your life. If you're born again, attend church and all that, you only have your natural life and your spiritual life. Of course, I don't mean that the, the people uh, who are not called ministry don't have a ministry. They do have a ministry. But the ministry is tied up to the natural development. A second call that constitutes full-time ministry is a different development altogether. It's a different ball game. And what we need to make each one of us aware is that uh, here is a time frame. The time frame. Maybe I should write my time backwards too. Anyway, time frame. I mean the natural, what are the natural developments in, in your life? Some of the developments are maybe when you have a, uh, you graduate from school, okay? And you go into the working life. Working life. And uh, here's another line here. And here's a big one. Uh, here is when you fell in love, you got married. Okay, for the family. A big commitment there. There's a natural line. Then you have a um, uh, time when you got your first car. And then uh, this SPSC coming in. A time when you got your first house. Or, and then your other blessings that may come. Now, some of these lines are not in this order of consistency because some of us may have help uh, from relations or what, and you may have your car here. 
and your your house here before you got married. Understand that those lines are not necessarily in their order. Some people have a reverse way. But obviously, without any great emphasis, every one of you will have those needs. Except those of you called to celibacy, then the big line is missing. Correct? All of us, you have have those needs. And you may start with a rented house or a borrowed car, whatever. But somewhere along the line, to progress and create those needs are there. They are present in a society that we live in where where things are so spread out within a geographical plane, uh, it would be very, very unlikely that we have to walk from place to place to minister. It will take you so long to reach another place. Uh, it's not as practical as in walking in those days to minister. Unless you're in the jungle, it's different, talking about cities. And then looking at spiritual life, in the spiritual realm, there are certain developments. There's a development where you encounter the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit to me is the most precious person that I've come to know. And uh, there's an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Of course, there's an encounter with Jesus that should have started here. And an uh, encounter with the Word of God. God. Then an encounter with the right church that leads you. And all these are various developments in your personal spiritual development. Then you have your ministry. In the ministry, you have a point where you uh, understand your gift. With every call is a gift. And there's another point where you have opportunity. And there's another point where you have uh, recognition. And then after recognition, it's easier, the skill is easier. There are other points where you begin to to share or impart your existing to others, etc. There are different development points in our ministry. If you don't see a three separate lines, you get into confusion. Example, let me try to make three lines become one line. In your life and ministry, while you're progressing, and all for you are three lines that are just running together, and you don't divide it correctly, you may get too much in a hurry in some natural area and don't develop some spiritual area, or you don't realize that being in a local church has to do with your Christian life, not your ministry life. Do you realize that? You see, some, some people come to the ministry, don't belong to any church, and they don't realize that being part of a local church has to do with your Christian life, not your ministry life. Now, of course, in the ministry life, that plays an important part. Because that's where your ministry flows from and for the purpose for example, even if you are not even if you are not going to minister to that church that you belong to, that church still plays a role in your life. For example, the church in Antioch in Paul's life. Do you know how many years Paul was away from Antioch church? When he travelled? He spent very little time in Antioch church in the latter years. And later on, he sort of, can I call it uh, closeness or fellowship, was with the Philippian church, but yet he still has the angel church. That is why when people leave the ministry, they leave the church. They don't have any church to go to. It's because they mix up between ministry and Christian life. That is why when sometimes people leave the ministry, they also leave the Lord Jesus Christ. Inconsistency. Ministry is ministry, spiritual life is spiritual life. They, they are connected, of course, related. But we should understand that the basic things, whether we are in the ministry or not, we should have in our Christian life. And if right now as a Bible student, I mean, in seeking for your ministry, you are not located in any local church. I tell you, you have a problem in your spiritual life, not your ministry life. Everyone needs a belonging. You need to recognize that it has nothing to do with your ministry life. It has to do with your spiritual life. Now, based on ministry, sometimes you are located at different churches. That's understood. Paul located himself at different churches based on ministry. But all the missionary journeys always finally conclude from Antioch and even Jerusalem. 
But you need other things to went back to Jerusalem. No one can succeed in the ministry without developing a spiritual life. Now, if all three lines are here, and we get confused between those things, sometimes the pursuit, there are so many things that we want. You need a car, you need a house, uh, you need uh, opportunities, and uh, you need the Holy Spirit, you need the Word of God, and uh, you need good church, and all these things are confused and you don't develop them properly. Now let me bring the skills in. It, you can see it's a confused life. You don't divide natural, spiritual, and ministry. It is very confusing in the development of your ministry. What we need to see is that the development of natural life from this point, now I begin the demarcation point. Let me use a different color. Blacky. Yes. Zoop. Let's say the first line, time scale, is at, um, let me see, a good time scale. Uh, okay, this is when you're born, uh, zero. Zero years old when you're born. And uh, then you have, when you are either 17, 18, or 21. That's another great epoch in your life. For many young people, they think that that is the life. <laughs> when they turn uh, 17, 18, or when they turn 21, ah, they think that's a great achievement. They don't know the rest of the world is in front of them. And uh, then let's say, without, without paying attention to all these other lines, there's another period of life when you turn 13, you turn 40, you turn 50, you turn 100. So that makes sure everyone is included here in this class. Okay? Notice something here. Let me put my life inside that one so you can identify with it. I started as in ministry at the age of 17, I went to the min, uh, to full time ministry at the age of 18. At the age of 17, I was the president of the youth fellowship in the Baptist Church in Jehovah's Road. So I was very active there and uh, with a very nice pastor, non spiritually but very nice man. And uh, I started at that level. Can you see that when I started new, young in the ministry, uh, 17, 18, I went into the ministry. I don't have a car, I don't have a house, I don't have a family, I don't have all those things. I'm starting at all these levels almost on equal point of view. And uh, because you understand SCSP has to be sacrificed for the ministry. I never thought about all these areas. All I wanted was to obey God. It was let me see now, it's 1995, 94, we move in, 93, okay. Let's say somewhere in 1993, uh, that would be minus two, two years. Um, so let's put that this is a starting place in my ministry, I put it as a different zero. And uh, I would have been about 17 years in a ministry. So that adds up to 1, 2, 34, 35. Okay, 35 years. By the time I turned 35, it was when I actually bought my first house. That has been 17 years in a ministry. I'm drawing a skill to educate young people and to educate those of you who are very successful in the, in the natural world, that in the ministry you give up SCSC and God gives it to you. But I find sometimes a lot of young ministers in the first five years and ten years they want SCSC. They want to buy a house of their own, they want to buy a car of their own and everything, or a brand new car. Uh, when did I bought my first car? Uh, 1990, Nineteen eighty six. Before that, we have a car, but it belongs to the ministry. I'm sure you know that it's a difference. It's a company car, and your car is a different car. 
1986, and uh, that would be about 10 years ago, uh, 9 years ago, and that makes it about 11 years in the ministry. 11 years in the ministry, and uh, that would be 18 plus 11, that would be 29 years. Pretty late, huh? Some of you, 21, but you don't got whatever. Now, remember that if you could do it earlier, it's because somebody help you. Correct? I had no one to help me. Maybe somebody helped you and you got it earlier. Some of you may have your house early. Somebody helped you. I'm talking about nobody helped me. I'm not taking a stand for my parents. Uh, my parents were not rich anyway. Uh, whatever inheritance my father left, when he passed away, everything uh, we, we, we let our mother take and my mother is still alive so that she could be sustained properly. And not a single help, not even for my own brothers and sisters who were uh, struggling with their own lives and trying to establish themselves. And uh, so it took me 11 years. For me, it took me 11 years before I bought my first car. Now, I had a car before. It was more the mini C car, right? That was... Uh, I'm sure you read about it in Alula Christian, Christian Mission uh, magazine. We have our first Dahasu Sharon. And um, we had that in 1976. 1976, that makes it about two years after that came out, plus one year. Uh, that would be about four years or five years in the ministry. Four or five years in the ministry. We had a ministry car. And we still live in a rented house. But more or less, I only live in a rented room. I was married and all I had was a room. We shared the house with other co-workers. And uh, we, we have a whole rented house only when we started COG. And that was in 1986. And uh, 1986. Okay, somewhere here. Same line. It's about 29 years ago. Our first car, our first rented house of our own. Before that, we stayed with associates. I remember when we were pastoring the work center, uh, there were about four, uh, three other workers who stayed with us. We took the master bedroom, and uh, our daughter was with us, at the time we were our, our daughter, and uh, then uh, the opposite room, one was a, a, a guest room, another was a, a, a room that is another worker, and then downstairs another worker, and uh, we stayed with them. I'm bringing you that when people look at me today, they say highly successful, like all kinds of blessings. They don't understand how many years it took. I'm young today because I started young. <laughs> now, wait, those of you older don't get discouraged to come to you after I encourage you. And, uh, and I'm sharing a fact of truth here. A lot of young people, when they start in the ministry, want a house of their own, a flat of their own, they don't care at all. Look, I shared for 11 years. I mean, it's not even my own house, a rented house. In the seminary, I stayed with different people. Every year, they change their roommate. <laughs> and you don't know who you're going to get for your roommate. And some of you realize that it's the most dangerous thing in the ministry. Thy roommate can rob thy concordance off. <laughs> so, most of you here, you're, you're among the, 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 the first few batches in this college. The day will come, Vision College will have hundreds of students, if not 1,000 over students, and we will have dormitories and all that, and they will not know what you all went through. Now, we're not expecting everyone to have the same experiences, but we expect that everyone will learn the same principles. With your various experiences. Many people, when they look at us, they think that's a shortcut taken. My friend, that was no shortcut. And for us, we enjoy, we enjoy the trip. I should say, stay with us. Sometimes we pray together and uh, we chat together. We go out and tap our foot together. It can be fun. Like a marriage, it can be a heaven or a hell, depending on how you make it. But I want to, I mean, we are all in the ministry, all students on your club coming. I want to educate you also, you don't get so impatient. Start out in the ministry, first thing you demand of yourself, I want my own house. I want my own car. What kind of this? This fellow needs a kid <laughs> somewhere to wake them up. Praise the Lord. We don't start that way. Now, I'm not saying some of us may have helped here and there, and, and we bypass some of those stages. 
Remember, there's no shortcut in learning principles. You may have shortcuts in getting something, but there are no shortcuts in learning principles and the things of this life. So then we have an average, uh, average, it took me, without any help, any external help, it took me 11 years to get my first car, and it was a second-hand Toyota Corona. It was, by that time I owned it, it was about uh, 8 or 10 years old. Praise the Lord. We bought it from, a, from a, a one of our church members, a company, a Japanese owner, and he owned a Gary, he was going off on his job, and we bought it from him. It was really so rotten, you had to change all the wheels. Praise the Lord. Eleven years. To buy our first house, it took us seventeen years in the ministry to establish ourselves. Now you see how a lot of young people get in a hurry. Too much in a hurry. You keep thinking of FCST, you will have no chance to establish the ministry. For me, my mind was not focused on all those things. I had only one goal in mind. I had to establish the ministry God has for me. I was on this area. I, don't, I, I didn't really care whether, whether I had anything, like, anything at the end of the ministry. I was interested in the ministry. So it's, uh, it's all I was interested in. The ministry was fully established three years after we started POG. I mean, we were quite recognized here and there. I mean, we were known here and there among people. But I mean, uh, fully established, financially stable, etc. Et uh, about three years in the 1986-1989. I mean, there's no denying what God called us to do. And uh, it took time to establish a ministry. Don't get in a hurry to go for FTST. Now, what about those older? Some of you who started older in life, you have spent some time in the natural realm here. Correct. And in the natural realm, you have actually established something. You establish a family, some of you are own cars, and you establish your house, then you enter into the ministry. Hello there. Even then, it also, let me point to the fact, me is blue now, let me point to the fact, you still roughly take the same amount of time. Don't talk about ministry, talk about natural. Without any help from anyone, it takes an average or possibly about depending on your, your salary screen, etc. But let's take a, sli a slightly average, not, not really someone who, who that, that far off straight away come in, earn four figure, five figure. But uh, uh, you probably bought your first car between eight to ten years in your job. Correct. You may have a company car, etc. That's not counted. But you bought your first car. Eight to ten years in your job. Then you bought your first house, okay? Maybe about 15 years. Now you have enough savings, etc. Some of us speak that to a sense up because we have external help. We have help from relations, from parents or whatever. They give some investment to get you a car early. They put investment to get your house early. Those are not counted. Remember, if you speak things up, if you forgot to learn the principles, you are different from another person who owns it and has it. Hello there. Principles cannot be learned except through experience. And you test it out and screw it out yourself. So it still takes about 15 years without any outside help. It's a reality. Even if you start earning four figure $1,000, how long does it take for you when you started with zero cents? To have enough to put a down payment for your car. Correct? How long does it take you to have a down payment to put it into a house, apartment? Six years. And then you are able to come into the ministry, you are free from this area. You come into the ministry, you can concentrate on different areas. You actually hop into the ministry at some point here. You still got to learn opportunity, etc., which is a different thing. Now, let's look at third category. Who were neither here nor there? And you go, yow, 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 yow. Instead of walking that side, you walk this side. You know? You're here, you fell into drug addiction. You know? You spend five years there and you end up with nothing and nothing. And then you, yow, 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 and uh, no steady job. 
even in the natural way you're failing. And uh, all these kind of things. And you come, when you enter the ministry, you're still square one. And by that time, you're 40 years old. I love it. Praise the Lord. <laughs> a plant life. There is no substitute for plant life. Amen. I teach all my children to plant their life. I mean, in the teaching on goal setting, we have a teaching which I teach our church on goal setting. I, 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 I told them very realistically. If you want to reach somewhere by the age of 40, you have to plan. Because the average person graduates at about age of 21 with a degree. If you don't have outside help, how do you reach somewhere at age of 40 without planning with, with certain natural things? Let's say you have your car, uh, house, and uh, you have a family, and uh, then you have uh, ministry, and uh, uh, spirituality, and all the other things. You don't reach from 21 to 40 without any goal. Yet there are a lot of young people who are just enjoying their lives and floating along without any objective. I had my objective when I was young. I knew where I was going, I know what I wanted out of life. And life is such if you don't know what you want out of life, life will give you the level worth. Know what you want out of life and pursue your goal. And between the young and 40, even if you progressively walk, let's say, in the natural realm, to progress, to reach somewhere in the natural, it takes some progression and some discipline. If you take a loan for a house, your maximum payment today it may take you to 60 years or 65 years, okay? If you take a loan of 25 years or 20 years, it, uh, uh, so, so every child, let's say 20 years, let's count 60 years, 20 years, that means that at the age of 40, you must have enough at least to put down for your house so that when you're age of 60, you have your house all paid for. You don't reach your age of 16, your house is half paid for. We're going to find the rest of the money. Can you see that? Some of us suffer consequences because we didn't plan our lives. By the time we awaken to the fact that we need to plan our lives, we are somewhere probably most people are about the age of 35 years old. They thought, it, hey, I got to plan my life here. I don't plan my life, I'm going nowhere. Excuse me, you just lost 10 years. But praise be to God, it's never too late to start. Better to start than never start. <laughs> You need to be realistic. Now, all these things that I'm sharing, all my staff, we have our staff retreat usually about once a year. Uh, and, and I teach my staff on all these planning details and all the areas because I want every one of my staff to progress. To be somewhere so that, okay, if not for the ministry, barring the part of the ministry which has no retirement, you could retire gracefully. Amen. So that you could go and serve God, maybe you're like, oh, I'm good job, I mean, he's there, and everything is settled, hallelujah, all children go and everything, hallelujah, you just serve God, hallelujah. But what happens if you're still struggling with paying a house, you know, planning with this, planning with that. I, I feel pain for when I see my own just numbers happening. 55 look for God. Why? You don't even have a house that you're still renting a house. An unplanned life is the most dangerous thing you could enter into in this life. Dangerous. Some of you who have never ever planned at all, wake up, wake up, wake up. Because <laughs> you may wake up too late. Who is this guy? Rob Van Winkle, who woke up after so many years and everything has changed. Now, there is a factor. Now, let's discount this factor. Now, none of you would be here if you were here. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and whatever it you come into, if you started late 40 years, it's still not too bad. Because I give you your assurance here. If you get established in a ministry with the right structure, FCSC will come to you. Seek first the kingdom of God and righteousness, it will be added unto you. Just to encourage you, in, in all, all these areas here, although we started late, we give our heart, life, soul to the ministry. There are many times we do without all these years, after 17 years. What is this? 17 years. Okay, 11 years we bought our first house. Our first house. And at uh, point, uh, we had bought our own office floor. 
is worth $1.2 million. Uh, which is fine. On paper, I'm a millionaire. That's paper only. <laughs> now, paper millionaire and cash millionaire is different. <laughs> paper millionaire means you keep paying off. <laughs> but the fact is that at the end, I took 15 year loan. At the end of 15 years, I'm 37. Okay, let's average plus 20. At, by the time, I am 57 minus... Uh, no, that was 20 years too much, right? Let's say 15. By the time, I am 50 years old. Everything is paid for. I have an office lot, I have this, I have that. I'm, I won't be struggling. I won't be begging for orphans. Now all this is plain life. Whether I'm in a ministry or not in a ministry, do you know my goals in life? By the age of 40, I'll be a millionaire. Of course, some people by the age of 30, they reach. They, 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 after for me, I, I, you know, I set my goals later. By the age of 40, I'll reach my target. I reach my target two years ahead of my goal. 38, uh, 37 plus. Now, I didn't start out in a ministry wanting to be a millionaire, but I believe that I could believe for it without asking for it. The church knows, everyone knows that I never asked for a cent. Never asked for anything. It is important for us to set goals in our lives and ministry to be established. I know. Uh, I gave my whole life to the ministry. I was in fact not content. I firmly believe. You see, you don't have to ask, you don't have to cover it. You just keep your mind on giving your life to God. And I believe, if you want to believe God to be a millionaire and ministry, you can be a millionaire. God will stop you. See, I'm trained enough in the ministry in the will of God to know that God will give you all that you can believe for. Just that you can give David. It's up to us to make sure you've got the proper structure in which to live your life. To do all that God wants you to do. It is important to establish those things. So while a lot of people are wasting time, there are a few things that to me that are very important. Besides, I have 40 principles of leadership. Those things are firmly in my life. Plus 10 things I love, 10 things I hate. Number one, how do you achieve those goals? I don't waste time. That doesn't mean I don't rest. Remember, balance work and play. Doesn't mean I don't rest. I don't waste time. Everything that I pursue must have a benefit. Must be reflected in what I want out of life. I do not waste time. And uh, time is a, the, most, the most precious commodity God gave us was life and time. With life, using time, we could do something. Everything that anybody has in this life is a result of what they work with their life and their time with the help of God, of course. Time to me is a precious commodity, which is why I don't waste time. To all my leadership, etc., and the people see me, I say, look, don't waste my time. If, if you want something, you do your homework and come and see me, because five minutes of my time, 15 minutes of my time can be doing a lot of things. My mind can be meditating and praying about different things. It's important to do a homework. I, 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 would not, I would not just sit around, take tarik, ah, another cup, please, take tarik, ah, another cup, please, take, ah, ah, I, I don't waste time. I don't waste time on the wrong fellowship, I don't waste time on things, etc. I don't waste time. Too precious. Some of us, some of you, the older you are, the more you realize how precious time is. Praise the Lord. Number two, I don't waste words. Some people talk, 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 but no action. Nothing done. While people are criticizing, doing me all, all those things, person you can do what they want, I mind my own business, I'm doing my thing. Because I'm going to live longer than you, five years time you may be dead and gone, I'll be around with some blessing. And a lot of these things that I'm doing, I mean, uh, remember, it's only the two years ago that I bought my house. It's only, uh, uh, this year that we bought our first office lot, during all this thing we went through in 1993-1994, some of the hardest phases in the church, when uh, there are periods when you are criticized more and then you are favored more and criticized more, favored more, criticized more. We know the cycle doesn't affect us because a billion years and it doesn't touch us anymore. It learns to laugh over it. And during this time, people are shooting you down, oh, look, this ministry happening, this ministry happening, the church growing, the church not growing. doesn't matter, I know where I'm going, I know the church is good. While all these things are happening, 
I don't care about what everybody says. I'm building my own life because by the time I turn 50, I'll be somewhere and some fellows who are doing all those nonsense won't be around. Hallelujah. Hello there. You know where you're going in life. You know what you want to do in life. Praise God. Some songs last just some few months. Some songs last a couple of years. But you know where you want. By certain age bracket, by certain things, you have achieved certain things that you want. That you want to do in your life. I don't raise words. There are a lot of people who... And if your words are getting the problem anytime. Talk too much. Basically, I'm a man of very few words. I just say it, do it. Sometimes I just do it, I don't say it. I just get the job done. And so I'm not impressed if a whole community comes and tells me, look, we've been meeting every week for all these things. I'm not impressed. If I have 400 meetings, then no. Uh, I'm not impressed. I'm impressed only by what you have done. If you have 400 meetings and achieve no results, mm, wasting time. I believe that we don't waste time, we don't waste work. You just get the job done. Hallelujah. And because of that, I am now advising, I mean, uh, just a typical story for, uh, uh, right. You know, during those times when we were having a 993, 94, among some of them, some of my close friends, you know, some of them are, are, are business people, and they look up to, to me for direction and counsel. During that time, some of them doubted what I was doing. But when I passed into this stage, they said, hey, how do you do it? While I'm here, they didn't know my homework was done down there. When they were running me down and looking and say, how can this be, how can this be done, and this cannot be achieved, this cannot be done. While you're wasting time saying all those things, I'm really doing those things to make sure I'm here. By the time I'm here, you wonder, hey, what was I doing? Yes, while you're wasting all those time doing those three years, 1993, 1994, that's when I started inventing my other games, and then we are launching this, the, the other games this year, and uh, uh, then we are going on. So, during all this time, the most toughest time that's when I get about my own business. I mean, good, you know, since nobody wants to see me, give me more time to do more things. Right. When you're famous, everybody wants you, everyone wants to see you, see you, see you, kind of thing. So sometimes we are so fed up, they don't want to see your face. Very good, give me more time. <laughs> you're not bothered by all these things. You know where you're going in life. And there are always cycles when you're popular, when you're more criticized, you know, people doubt you, people don't doubt you. I mean, Moses has his cycle, Jesus has his cycle, everybody has his cycle, it doesn't move you anymore. And you reach a certain level where nothing moves you. So I'm beginning that because I realize that these are very real to some of your lives. And I love you all and I'm concerned that whatever age you all start with, I want, I want more of us to be able to sit when you, all of you turn 55 and join our brother John here. I'm sure he's going to leave on and on. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and we're all going to be able to sit around. Uh, some of you are going to graduate, you're going to go out. And maybe in a 10 years time, 20 years time, I can invite you all over to a resort that we probably own by that time. And uh, that, uh, you now we all go together and say, hey, hallelujah, how's life, you know, how's this? And some of you will be telling all your nice stories, etc. And uh, you see the around, you know, I, I, I want that. I want to see all of you around in 10 years time, 20 years time. Hallelujah. And you're successful, you're doing all those things, you know, uh, all those uh, blessings that God has. I want to be able to see you all there. And I really want to be able to see all of you and we are in heaven, you gather around, maybe one day we go for a park retreat for former Vision College students and alumni <laughs> in heaven. And we sit around the park, you can tell all the stories that, that, that uh, need to be told and shared and everything. And you can see everybody else around. We want to succeed very much. You don't know how much I want everyone to succeed. I don't share my secrets unless I want people to succeed. My only motivation is that others can do it too. Now, some of the pastors who associate with me, not from our church, I mean, our church is fine, uh, they are from other churches associated with me, they follow the principles. Today, they are keeping some areas. Some of them bought their first car, their first house. The only sad thing is they got, they sell by FCSC. Because they don't have the same commitment. Now, some people learn the principles about too much in a hurry. Don't get in a hurry. Look, some of these things take 10 years, 11 years, 12 years. Look, don't get too much in a hurry. If God, to other people, other sources, bless you and and uh, external sources bring you faster into some of these natural things, just bow your knees and give thanks to God. But learn those principles. If your eyes are on food, clothing, shelter, transportation, and all you are thinking about while you're in Bible school is to own your first Ferrari, we have to pray for you. 
Come on, in Jesus' name. Now. <laughs> Never succeed. Cannot. No thing cannot. Not good. Yeah. Of course, those who are older in life, they, some of you have gone to all those and then you move into ministry. And see, you need to, it takes time. Now, because I didn't go that road, I, I, I can only guesstimate. So I travel this road. Some of you travel that road. My guesstimate is that it may take you about, probably about five years or so to develop, to, to understand the opportunity for your gift. Maybe about three years, because three is a nice number, disciples are three years with Jesus, to understand your gift. This is without external help. With external help, special tuition. Right? Uh, tuition. Okay. From a mentor, you may speed it up to one year or two years. Now, I know every one of us want to do as much as we want in as short a time as possible. I know, you see, uh, so you want to do as short a time. Some things cannot be hurried. I'm sorry for you, poor. It's a lot of it. <laughs> Some things can never be hurried. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but uh, whatever it is, it may take basically maybe five years, maybe with, with, with extra tuition, then uh, maybe about three years or so. Uh, look, even you add three plus three, you have six years before you have opportunity. Don't talk about having recognition yet. See, I discourage people in too much of a hurry going somewhere. You don't have to. All you have to do is pray. And in any situation you are in, whether recognized, not recognized, accepted, not accepted, opportunity, not opportunity, there is only one road that is called the perfect view. It may be recognized, unrecognized, lonely or noisy, but there is only one road that is always the perfect view. Take that road. Take that road. There is only one road that is the perfect view. There, there is a lot of other roads that is called permissive view, but only one that is called perfect view in a little decision in your life. Well, that's uh, just a little extra there to help and encourage some of you in the ministry. Thank you. And uh, so you don't get too much in a hurry, whether you're traveling on a natural curve or spiritual or etc. And on the spiritual side here, I wish I didn't touch much on, I had my own goal. When I had my own goal that I will read through the Bible how many times. That I will outline the whole Bible how many times. These are all my spiritual goals. And I pray in tongues for how long? So all these are spiritual goals that you set, that you achieve at the same time. Praise the Lord. Let's look at the book of Acts in Acts chapter 6. Where we have noticed that the apostles, pastors and teachers are already developed in the book of Acts. And in chapter 7 and 8, we see the confirmation of what is developed. See, from 2 to 5, we see the development of apostles and they function as pastors, evangelists, uh, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. At 6, apostles, pastors, and teachers are now prominent, and uh, prophets and evangelists are still missing, and they are there actually because the apostles are growing in that, in that ministry uh, while nobody is doing that job. In Acts 7, we find very prominent Stephen. In Acts 8, we find very prominent Philip. You notice the key in that flow. Because they are now developing as pastors and teachers. Ministers in their own right having an impact on the society around them. And for the first time, they have an impact even on the Jews. And all the time the Jews confront Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John, Peter and John, they go, ah, Peter, just suddenly they look around, suddenly they go, Stephen also, to confront with. And Stephen confronts the high priest. I mean, just look at it from the high priest's point of view. At first he got two, nine, got three, sometimes four, five. So what's happening? They're multiplying up there. Now he has Stephen to confront. And not only does he have to confront Stephen, Stephen knew how to preach, how to teach him, and how to speak the words of the Holy Ghost. I mean, just look at it from the high priest's point of view. At first, you got two, nine, got three, sometimes four, five. Say, so what's happening? They're multiplying up there. Now he has Stephen to confront, and not only does he have to confront Stephen, Stephen knew how to preach, how to teach, and, and how to speak the words of the Holy Ghost. 
It says in Acts chapter 7. Well, uh, <coughs> let me look at Acts 6 first, the introduction part in uh, verse 8 on Stephen's life. It suddenly began to speak about these people's ministry to confirm what we are saying here. New ministries are now rising, pastors and teachers in their own right, as part of the revival of God. Notice that the attention are no more focused on the apostles. It is only back focused on the apostles for a short time in chapter 12 of Acts, but otherwise now it focused on other ministries. That doesn't mean that Peter and John have backslided, my friends. They are still doing their job, they have a job to do. They are still walking in the perfect will according to what God has for them. There are times that their leadership skill is necessary. Remember in Acts 10, you see Peter going into the Cornelius household. Remember the line that we, we, we mentioned last time, that there are many things going on in the kingdom of God. You don't expect that the perfect will of God today is found only in one church, A. And in B, C, D, there's nothing going on. No! God is doing a lot of things in His perfect will in the body of Christ. But from time to time, He is highlighting some things to us. He can report it in the papers, or in the newspapers, or in the, in the Christian magazine. He highlights different things. Two years later, they will no more be highlight. Kansas City prophets are no more the highlight. It was a highlight two years ago. Remember that? Does that mean that Kansas City uh, Church is no more in the will of God and there's no revival taking place? I can assure you, you take a uh, ticket, you travel there, you see fine, powerful, prophetic ministry. No, God highlights something. And people who are in nature, many young Christians, see this as a real revival. That's just wrong. Absolutely wrong. The revival is here. Right now, while this is being highlighted, today, laughing in the street is being highlighted. I can assure you that something else that is being built that will be highlighted for the next two, three years that God is getting ready now. But for them to be highlighted in three years' time, now they have to be doing something. Understand that? Now, while this is being highlighted, and if they don't walk in the perfect will of God, now, three years later, they won't be highlighted. And three years later, when they are highlighted, it's because they walked in the will of God three years ago, which is now. And nobody hears of them. Let's understand that revival is everyone doing the perfect will of God. So once in a while, people get highlighted. At first, Peter and John, now Stephen is the one, highlight. I put a yellow highlight on him. Hallelujah. Stephen is not highlighted. Suddenly he becomes prominent. He was the one who challenged the high priest now. Where was Peter and John? You would think that, oh, Peter and John, they were hiding in a, in a toilet somewhere. No, they're still doing God's will. God raised up different people at different times because maybe he was trying to speak to the high priest too. Maybe Peter and John have spoken and spoken. Now they need to hear from somebody else. From Stephen, who is as fiery but even more didactic. In uh, Acts chapter 7, Acts 7, uh, oh, have you finished Acts 6? We haven't, right? Acts 6, <laughs> praise God. In verse 6, uh, verse 8, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. There arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freed men, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen, arguing with Stephen. Now, Stephen now had a prominent job. And they were not able to receive the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. In other words, I'm trying my best to tell you that Stephen was a pastor teacher. Philip started as a pastor teacher, although he's not called, but he started in that area. He teached a bit, but not as much as Stephen. Stephen was more of a teacher than Philip. Philip more preached than teach. Pastor preacher. Not yet evangelist. They are coming up. And uh, then in chapter 7, well, let's look at the end of chapter, chapter 6. And all who sat in the council, what council it is? The Sanhedrin council. The top not authority in those days. Looking steadfastly, he saw his face as the face of an angel. Wow, they see the glory of God all over his face. Oh, wow, a rosy, rosy man. Oh, shiny. Right. Of course, just without glasses, probably. Those things not invented yet. And they saw, oh, wow, the glory of God. 
the any of those Christians in Jerusalem say, this is not the revival, this is meant to follow. You know, don't follow Peter and John anymore. No more, no more. No such thing. Every place, every ministry has its time to be focused. After your focus time, you go back and do your old job. Continue to go back and do your job. I mean, once in a while, some of our names may get on the new state time and you do different things. I mean, the good things, I don't want you to do wrong t- rotten things and then you slice there, you know. Pastor lo- loses his temper, beats his member up, you know. <laughs> don't do the wrong things. I mean, do the right things and it gets reported. But what happens after the report? You've got to go back and do your job still. Do you mean, ah! I received it. Ah, my name is in the papers. If you really that desperate in your name being the papers, I could just pay for a small advertisement spot and put that. Habakkuk Tan Ah Kao wants his name to be here. <laughs> when you look at Stephen, they think about the glory of God all over him. Then it's not mentioned about Peter or John. Different manifestations. And there's no argument against him. He was such a good debater. They argued and debated until they got no more words to say. They know what to say. Acts chapter 7, Stephen know the word of God. You look at how he preached the word of God. You know the time frame. You know what happened. After how many years and who went where, etc. Obviously, you know the word of God. Look at his sermon in Acts chapter 7. Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to their heart. They got no words left to say. That is why the Bible says, they next at him with a teeth. They can't say Amen because they don't believe. They can't say Hallelujah because they don't really worship God in that way. They can't say anything. So they go... <laughs> <laughs> so it's a lot. They next their teeth. Nothing else to say. And they rush to see them and they all take him like him. Hallelujah. Now, isn't that glorious for Stephen? One moment looks like an angel, the next looks like Peter and Sean leading. <laughs> Remember this, the tears and the tears of the world are changeable. Just hold your place in Acts 7 and just go forward to look at one principle here. In the book of Acts, and uh, let's take a look at Acts 14. Verse 11 himself. When the people saw what Paul had done, Acts 14, verse 11, they raised their voices saying in a Lyoconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, they call Zeus. Well, not bad, now they call you God. They say, Wow, Paul Macron is here. <laughs> what was the biggest Indian God there? Kisna. Kali. Kali. Yeah, what a terrible fellow. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so what? Oh, my God, he's here. Or it could be to the Indian culture. Oh, this is Kali himself. <laughs> they are calling the apostles God in small g. To their understanding. I mean, when people start calling you God, a Roman emperor almost worship as God. Most people who are not in their spiritual frame and who are carnal and greedy and covetous, who, who are like devilish, who want worship, worship, ah, good, good, not treat me like God. Look at all these other cops. Remember this guy in the papers, what is this, this funny name got arrested, who's trying to bomb the whole of some, you know right? his name, right? I forgot his name. Ah, oh, uh, Hiroko would know what his name is. How to pronounce this name? A-U-M. Oh, the army group. Praise God. But what about Korah? And some of these other cults. You know what happened? They were treated like God. Sun, Yan, Moon. Treated like God. Correct? All the other disciples sacrificed. The leader enjoyed. Even the water he drank. Ah, holy water. <laughs> but it's really like God. They treat him like God. A lot of people, when they reach this state, they say, well, well, I'm God. Now get me two Rolls Royce, five BMWs, six Mercedes, and a Learjet. Like Jesus said, they have their reward on this earth, and up there is a big debit. You heard about credit in heaven, right? Where do you hear about debit in heaven? 
all results, Jesus says, for the punishment. <laughs> oh, wow. They call, these people give the highest natural adulation. They call Barnabas Zayas and Paul Mercury, the chief speaker in Expo 10. Hermes, uh, Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. Then at the 13th, the ceremony begins. The Toa Pek Kong priest comes. The Kali priest, for then the Zayas priest comes. His temple was in front of the gate. Oh, the auction, garland, ceremony, titusan men. <laughs> all come together to crown, crown them. And uh, what did the apostles do? I think a lot of cult leaders would love Acts 14, verse 12 and 13. Thank God there are none here. Hello. <laughs> they will love that. But in verse 14, when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard it, what did they do? They tear their clothes. Right, they go. Say, ah! <laughs> I should have actually brought a real set over the tear. <laughs> Maybe in my case I would if I'm preaching to a big crowd. You know, if I preach a big crowd, I look for a good illustration. So one day get a real old set. You, know, you really wear, wear it. And, then, and I, of course underneath must be another set to be decent. <laughs> Then you get it. <laughs> Some of the ladies were faint by that time. <laughs> and uh, then they ran in among the multitude, saying, Men, men, why? Why are you doing all this? <laughs> and uh, we, we are also like you. We eat food like you, we eat one dang meat like you, we eat. What do you eat downstairs? You eat some sort of uh, brani rice like you. <laughs> We are close like you, we have to go to the toilet like you, we go to the bed like you. We are men. And it says here, uh, verse 18, with these things they could scarcely restrain a multitude from sacrificing to them. Well, simply okay. Answer bad news come. I found that I found that sometimes people are the most fickle. When they hear bad news, they turn their way. Though the good news took, they turn their way. The multitudes are not people you can really rely on. When the bad wind that comes from the Jews, from Antioch and Iconium, they came and persuaded the multitude. How did they persuade? They say, oh, these guys, they are crooks, rotten fellows, terrible fellows. You know, you should have known what they have done to Iconium. Oh my, you should have seen it too bad, we don't have photographs, but just depend on our lives, our words, I mean. And uh, so all the worst things, the rotten fellows, terrible Jews, black flighted buzzards, you know, going around claiming to the Jews, they actually are not Jews, in fact, we are just, we are just taking them up on the synagogue, and uh, all these things, and uh, all these worshippers of Jesus, wow, yeah, 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 yeah. The next moment, they say, Kill them! Kill them! Kill them! Kill! Kill! Right. One moment they're going to worship them. The next moment they're going to kill them. Never trust the Gallop Paul. Pastor, I won't go and trust all those things. Those things are not dependable. You know how? I mean, anyone could study. You just go on and start a, a new rumor. You know, sometimes I enjoy people studying rumors because I like to watch them. Sometimes they study good ones too, you know. Yeah. They say, oh, Pastor, very rich, he's a multi-millionaire, he's a million dollars, he's very tough. I smile and say, praise God, now, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you for your faith in me. Hallelujah. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> no problem, I mean, you know, they believe in God for me. Hallelujah. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Or sometimes they spread all things around me, whatever. You're not moved by them. And you never depend on a gallop pole. It's, it's so easy to change it. You know, I also can try to find my own rumor. I just have to make sure I talk to the top dogs to people in church. <laughs> so I say, hey, there's some good news now. This thing's happening now. It's really happening. God, I see all the things. And uh, they follow the whole session. <sighs> easy. People are so easy to manipulate. Of course, I don't do such things like that. 
<laughs> but people are so easy to manipulate. So easy. And that's a sad thing. And you know how we are stop them from being manipulated? When the five ministries come, they will no more be tossed to and fro by every being a doctor. Thank God, for me, I know that in tabernacle glory, the church is established, you cannot manipulate some of the people anymore. Even you, folks, and you, Bible students, if you bring a professor who comes and says, Jesus is only a son of God, I think some of you will run him down. It's not only run him down, but run him out of the church, out of this school. But you guys are strong enough. This is a different Bible school. In fact, we have to warn some of the prophetic coming in and say, look, these are not normal students. <laughs> Which doesn't mean that these are abnormal students. <laughs> so look, they know the word. They've been taught the word. They've been taught all I think. See, when we teach, we teach you all the excuses so that you cannot have any other possibility. Say, look, you teach the wrong thing, please be careful. And moreover, even if they can't do anything, at the end of the term, we still do something. In our special class, we dare to be all the wrong things. And analyze, scrutinize it, you know, maybe we need to change, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but we will analyze it. We're not afraid of examining the word. One thing we never have. It's really that something that we need to receive, let's examine it and receive it. Amen. So praise the Lord. Only the five ministries can establish people such that you cannot be talked to and from. And some of you have gathered that time. Some of you, it's not easy to deceive you now. You know, some evangelists come, loud mouth, you know. <laughs> Excuse me, evangelists. <laughs> all, all, everyone has their thoughts, right? Wait, wait, tell them, talk about five, four, all your witnesses. And, uh, ah, hallelujah, praise! Praise the Lord is here! But you are well thought in the anointing. You don't see the anointing, you only see emotion. <laughs> and you come and praise all people. Hallelujah! Oh, he's shaking. He's shaking. He's shaking. He's shaking. Actually, the evangelist is shaking. Not him. Shaking. Can you see the power of God? Look, his head is moving. <laughs> we know better than that. But if somebody tries to push you down, what do you students do? In front. I know, I know some of you will be so gentle. You're so diplomatic. You're diplomatic even in, in future things. I mean... You know, they lay hands on you, and you know there's no anointing you, so. <laughs> and you could do it so well, you know that the people falling under the power, the real one, they don't bend your knees, so you make sure your knees is not bent. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And you reach a point where, I mean, you can't, you can't make up the Holy Ghost. You know it's there, you know it's not there. You know when it's a flesh, you know when, when it's not in a flesh. I uh, realize that your Gallup poll cannot be depended upon. So in Acts chapter 7, when they heard these things in verse uh, 54, all, at first they think he was an angel, but look at verse 54, now they tried to kill him. Next of this, they took him and they, in verse 59, they stoned Stephen. If Stephen's message was more glorious, Stephen's life was even more glorious. The way he died. I'm always interested in a minister's life rather than a minister's gift. Because if the gift is glorious, the life must be even more glorious. Correct. But sometimes you find a gift is glorious, but you can find black spots in there. You check it up in your life, there's inconsistency as well. Consistency is one of the most ingredient, important ingredients in our ministry. You're consistent in how you apply the principles in your daily life as well as in your ministry life. And Stephen here, I mean, a lot of us admire his message, his preaching. Okay? For me, I admire how he died. A lot of people, when they're being stoned, will say, God. Curse them! Destroy! Vengeance, Lord! And here's a man who pray. Father, he says, Lord, do not touch them with this sin. And he died. One pastor teacher cried off the sin. Imagine, immediately rise up, immediately die. <laughs> not bad. Some people are called to this martyrs. So, Lord. 
Any more years here, call to the market. Praise the Lord, don't be shy. Praise the Lord. Because the students here are interested in helping to train you. <laughs> no. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we realize that there is a pastor teacher there and uh, Acts chapter 8. Acts 8. Verse 4 and 5. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitude, the one that caught, he did the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now suddenly Philip has a tremendous ministry, preaching the word of God, teaching the word of God. You don't find Peter and John doing these things? Did anyone complain? No, because Peter and John had their job to do. If Peter and John go and do exactly what Philip did, no one will be doing what Peter and John did, and there will be failure down back home. So they had their job to do. And they went forth, and uh, Philip had a lot of people baptized, a lot of converts, etc. The whole city, in truly the whole city, was moved, both men and women. In verse 11, they healed him because they saw his hand that is the other uh, person, uh, uh, we saw three that is uh, one element. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus, both men and women were baptized, and Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. He was amazed seeing the miracles and signs which were done. When the apostles who had just heard the familiar received the word, they sent Peter and John to them. So we have the rise of the fivefold five ministry, pastor and teacher uh, coming forth. And then you enter into a different phase, it's more or less implied that something has grown by that time. In the book of uh, Acts 9, it's about false life. By the time you reach Acts 10, something else has risen. We already know they had their apostles, their pastors, their teachers. And we know from Acts 8 that still it was slowly going to be an evangelist. Which, at the end of Acts 21, Acts 21, we are told he has a title attached to his name. Acts 21. Verse 8. Philip the Evangelist. Acts 21 verse 8. And we know that prophets have now arisen. And these are not the apostles anymore. These are real genuine prophetic ministry. In Acts 10... Acts 11, that's right, Acts, Acts 11, from Acts 8, 10, Acts 11, there is a different phase that the church actually moved into in verse 27. Acts 11, verse 27, it says, in those days, prophets came from Jerusalem. Do you notice? From Jerusalem. If you find prophets in Acts 11, Verse 27, that means that in Acts 11, if the prophets come, they will grow somewhere back here, Acts 10, Acts 8. I mean, when you see them, that's not when you do it. When you go out and you look at a place and the building is up, that doesn't mean that's the time that the building began. It began three years ago, probably, the foundation. When you see them performing, you give them an average of about two to three years to come forth, Two to three years backward will bring them back to Acts 8, Acts 10. Which means that the fivefold was developing. And by Acts 11 and Acts 12, one of the apostles died. James the apostle died, was killed by Herod. And you have other, other leaders coming out. Now you notice something in Acts 15. Acts 15, verse 6. So the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And you notice a group called the elders. The elders are those pastors and teachers. By the time you find them in Acts 15, you minus off about five years, you will find that it's during the second phase. When was the phase? I point it to after Acts 6. 
and it's a phase right after Acts 8. From Acts 8 to Acts 11, Acts 12, was a different phase to enter into. At that time, God was starting a new church in Antioch, far away. And tomorrow we will study what the, the different development of that church. It developed differently. But still, you need the five-fold ministry. And what we see in the church in Jerusalem, that they started with apostles, who also do the work of prophet, even though pastor, teacher. Then you get into Acts 6, you get apostles, pastors, and teachers. Prophet, evangelist, teachers, do not out yet. Somewhere at the end of this period of Acts 8, there was a transition. Philip started evangelistic ministry. He may not be an evangelist yet. Somewhere after that, between 8, 10, 11, it's a different phase. By Acts chapter 11, I would say that all the five fold was solid there in the church. For them to stand out people means that they are locally already very strong. They are firmly established as a fivefold church. They have all the fivefold. They have the apostles, prophets, evangelists, evangelists, pastors, teachers. All the fivefold are there. And the revival continued burning hot. Even later when Paul ministry took off, the church still was very strong. Paul used to keep coming back to Jerusalem and Antioch. There are two places he keep going back to. Which means that he recognized the fire of God that was still burning there. It was not that the revival stopped, it never stopped. The good thing about the book actually is the revival never really stopped. It went on and on and on and on. In fact, the revival went on right through the first 300 years of A.D. It really burned hot. As long as there are five more ministers there, it's the church there is established. The Rosen Church. Tomorrow we we'll look at establishing another church. Praise God. Let's go to yeah. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We are after God that you continue to reveal your plans and your purposes for our lives. Father, you have a perfect plan for each one of us. A proper time, a proper place for each one of us. We thank you, Lord, that Matthew 6.33 is so true. When you seek first your kingdom and your righteousness in God, all the things in this life shall be added to us. Father, we dedicate our lives not to the pursuit of wealth, not to the pursuit of fame, not to the pursuit of pleasure. We are willing, O oh God, to suffer inconvenience because we don't pursue pleasure. We are willing, O oh God, to suffer and uh, sacrifice personally because we are not in pursuit of wealth. We are willing, O oh God, to suffer rejection, isolation, ostracizing because we are not in the pursuit of fame or acceptance from men. But we are the people called, we are destiny to do something in this life, something eternal, something spiritual. And something that will birth in the hearts of men and women on this planet earth. That one day, in time to come, they will know that there is a life that is coming God. That has burned itself out 100% for God. And may that flame in our lives be caught on by others as well. Father, we most of all want to give you glory, honor, and worship for all that you do to our lives. We recognize there is nothing in our lives that we could claim credit for. There's nothing in our lives that we could really say that it's really ours. For we came to you with nothing. And even all that we have in this life is nothing compared to the pursuit of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But Paul, we say, O oh God, that we continue to strive for the highest calling, Lord, to know Jesus, to know Him, and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Lord, seal this in our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.